Well, welcome everyone to the 1619 Project discussion. Uh, we have a couple of special guests from Pacific Oak College this morning. Uh, Yolanda Carlos and Christy Waterman are gonna talk to us about discrim discrimination and early childhood education. So uh, uh, with that, I wanna just turn it over. So Yolanda and Christy, uh, take it over and uh, give us the presentation and then we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, RG. I'll begin. Good morning, good afternoon. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here today presenting on the topic of historical issues that impact children of color in early childhood education. And so first, what I want to delve into or to set up the frameworks of um, education and two questions of education two and education four. But before that, um, uh, to be able to question, to analyze and practice critical thinking, to search for logical and scientific reasoning behind all actions and to raise awareness, to be creative. This is the highest form of intelligence. And then to be able to differentiate between right and wrong, to be able to mount balance moral and ethical dilemmas in the workplace and in everyday life. This is also critical thinking and higher intelligence. But when we're looking at education, we can often think of education is helpful in the ability to reduce crime rate. So for example, the Alliance for Excellent Education 2013 did a research study that showed that increasing high school completion rate by 10% of all men ages two to 60 will lead and has led to a decrease of 20% in assault murder and arrest rates. And the Policy Institute, the Justice Policy Institute, um, attributed a 5% increase in male high school graduation rates pr would produce an annual savings of 5 billion in crime-related expenses. So we can see that um, education to empower and lift people up out of crime to help our economy is a good social construct. Education is seen as a social construct, a social process involving the whole conscious self of feelings, emotion, memory, affects, and a epistemologically curious mind that is capable of knowing, thinking, and creating. This is Paolo Fieri. And Pacific Oaks, uh, that's one that we really, um, um, lean on his frameworks. It is also education, uh, when we're looking at education, as far as Pacific Oaks College is concerned, it's the focus on the inner work that examines ourselves openly and honestly to purge out any resemblance of selfishness, depravity, or insecurity. Or in other words, what we say at PO is be the change you want to see in the world. First, I'd like to expound on knowledge for, according to Paolo Fierio, it's a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. This is called the banking model of education. That's the top down. And it's the gaining of theoretical and technical skills to earn a degree. This is education two. Earn a degree, a certification, to gain the knowledge and technical skills for best practices for the profession of their choice, to earn a living, to apply information, to solve problems and answer questions. Or maybe, if asked to, to generate an idea in the workplace. It is also to create the understanding of communication between customers and coworkers and all stakeholders. Bottom line is, is that it is to listen, to follow instructions, and not to question. However, Paolo Fierro and um, Pacific Oaks College and one of my uh, flagstone people that I like to quote is Chomsky. 
He says there's two purposes of education. To lead or draw out, according to some, to draw others out of darkness and into a more monogamous view. It is the highest goal in life to inquire and to create. The purpose of education is to help people to learn in their own, on their own, and how to master that knowledge and how to use it. So let's look at early childhood education. One thought is that from the early years in the young childhood of young people, they have to have a place where they will, this is that education too, to learn how to follow orders, much like an animal. And according to Dewey, who is another, um, you could say the, um, theorist that P.O. draws upon, and Chomsky, the education for is a model that, Im well, we look at the education too as a model that imposes a debt that traps students and young people into a life of conformity and debt. This is the exact opposite of enlightenment. Preschools, um, basically, uh, when we look at it, there's three intersections of historical questions of doctrines that we consider. So it's philosophical, psychological, and educational. So the doctrines, historically, um, the pedagogical doctrines have informed the work of early childhood as a means to lift individuals up out of off. Uh, out of poverty into greater equality. Child care facilities were created in response to patterns of maternal employment for either welfare system or the federal government, which stigmatized poverty. But mostly federal programs were considered temporary and emergency measures in response to a national labor crisis. The history of child care really created a two-tiered system. So um, the two-tiered system is based on socioeconomic status. The nursery school and kindergarten system was really considered a focus of enrichment, of enriching what was available at the home with the aim of educating and socializing the child. The second was a stratis uh, pardon me, stratified system of preschool care and education with the function of a temporary short-term emergency system for dealing with the crisis of maternal employment. We have a slide uh, kind of that's going to discuss this, so I'm just going to go over it very briefly. But in 1912, the U.S. Children's Bureau was founded calling for policy for mothers so that they could stay home with their children. However, this only helped uh, those of upper socioeconomic economic status. And in 1930, every state of the union had some form of mothers or widows pension to address the needs of low income mothers and pushed childcare into the shadows of charity. Additionally, many mothers were taking their children to work with them or left them home at, alone. And there were many injuries and even fatalities that resulted from this. Then came the New Deal and the New Deal came into effect um, uh, where um, the emphasis on child care. Again, it was a time of crisis. And at that point, there were fewer than 300 nursery schools in operation compared to 800 day nurseries. And charitable donations declined, forcing 200 day nurseries to close between 1931 and 1940. Um, so PO history, when we look at our PO history, uh, Pacific Oaks Children's School was established in 1945 by six local families in Pasadena. And shortly thereafter, the college was created to train educators with the tradition of the Quaker roots of social justice, respect, diversity, and inclusion with the belief that everyone has an inner light worth nurturing. 
And it's important for me to just kind of bring out and highlight that Pio uh, hired the first Japanese American teacher um, living out its core values in 1945. And then in 1964, highlighting uh, President Johnson signed uh, the War on Poverty legislation, providing an opportunity for families to lift themselves out of poverty through various means of employment and education initiatives. One in, of those initiatives was the Head Start program, which was really designed um, much like a, an award-winning win, program called the Peabody Education Program. However, President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's um, um, project was short-lived. It did reduce poverty by 30%, but there has been little progress since then. Okay, Christy, you can take over. <clears throat> so in kind of arranging how we wanted to um, kind of guide this discussion, we came up with some questions. And so we would ask um, for you to consider what childhood experiences did you have with peers or adults who were different from you in some way? And um, to kind of ex in invite you to uh, share that if you feel comfortable um, with us. Well, this is Will. Oh, I, go I, ahead. I, I might share my experience was as an early child was being reared in North Carolina in the 30s and 40s under Jim Crow. So my experience with people who were different from us in basically everything was around race, where there were black people who were our servants, including the woman who raised me as my nurse. And uh, obviously there was a big class difference and a racial difference. In my context as a child though, I wasn't aware of the racial differences so much as the fact that they were different color. It was a very intimate relationship as far as a kid was concerned. Uh, I learned later about the other levels of racial discrimination. Thank you. Uh I'm Nancy, and I grew up in a small town in rural Nebraska. So my experience uh, with the children and the families that I grew up with was that we were pretty um, homogenous. Uh, the differences might be that some of us grew up on farms, and some of us grew up in the little village. Um, economic class difference probably was there, but I certainly didn't notice that as a child. In my experience, um, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut on my grandfather's farm. And I went to a small country school. Um, and I remember our family, just, you know, we got through the depression. I was born in 1932. And I, I just, you just sort of assume everybody's like you. But then I began, when I got a little older, I was allowed because the town was very safe. We walked all over miles, you know, or rode a bicycle. And I went to visit kids who lived down near the river in houses that had used to be sea captains' homes that were turned into rentals. And I remember going into one where a girl in my class in junior high school lived. And I know she had things wrong with her, like she had granulated eyelids and there were lice in school and things like that. And when I went into her house, there was one CD. That was the furniture. There were wooden floors, no carpets. And this was my first understanding that 
there were people who had very, very little. And it was an eye as far as race difference. We had two kids in junior high school, a, a black family in, were brother and sister. And I never really thought that much about things. And I know I've this before about and Arthur Lee Harrington was standing in the aisle, and the woman sitting next to him asked him to move. And that was my first uh, inkling that Black people were okay. I just didn't expose to any Black people. Then ended up marrying a Southerner from Atlanta and living in Atlanta at one point in time and living in Houston and broadening my understanding. I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. This is Dick or RG. And I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, which at the time I think was about 200,000. So I considered it a city at the time. And uh, my grandparents were directly from Ireland. And we, my mother moved in with them during the war because my father was overseas. And so I grew up with my grandparents in the house. And my grandfather was home all the time because he'd had a heart attack. And, and so my mother went in and he had a plumbing and heating company. And my mother would go to work and kind of take care of the business uh, while he stayed home. So he became a surrogate father to me at that point. We had, uh, of course, everything was very much racially segregated in the South. There's no doubt about that. But we had servants in the house, so there were always Black people around. And, and my first racial memory occurred during that time when I must have been about five years old or something like that. And I was in the kitchen and the, the uh, woman who was our servant at the time was washing dishes or something. And she washed up her dishes that she had eaten from and put them under the sink. And I thought that was a little, something struck me about that. And I asked my mother, why was she not using the same dishes that we were? She had a plate and a knife and a fork, a spoon, cup, and they were kept under the sink rather than in the cabinet where all the other dishes were. And something struck me wrong about that. And I asked my mother about it and the explanation was a non-explanation. It was basically, that's the way things are. The other early memory, very early memory that I have was that we had a, a black babysitter who took care of us, you know, who was really a caretaker for the kids during the day. And I remember pleasant times with her and I had a little book, you know, where this seems to be something that it was just a plain book where people would write things about, you know, about me growing up or something. And she wrote a little saying in there that stuck with me. It was like something that was done over the over a little of a doorway, the way it stuck in my memory. And it said, it said, there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that none of us should uh, uh, criticize the, the, the rest of us. So, and that struck me as a piece of folk wisdom. And it came from this black woman who probably was a teenager, but seemed like a grown up to me. And uh, so that I think has shaped my perception of race throughout my entire life and it so I felt like I didn't have I didn't share a lot of the same attitudes that other people in the south had about racial separation and discrimination and uh, so I think that that shaped a lot of my perceptions and how my thought process has developed since that time but this was of course a highly racially segregated society. And I later learned many, many years later that Shreveport, which I thought was a civilized area, was kind of a center of a lot of lynchings around in the in that area, which of course was not the kind of thing that you grew up learning about. That was just all that kind of information was suppressed. So that's the, the history, my history, early history of racism and, and the knowledge and experience of it. Christy, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is Yolanda, and I'd like to just kind of expound on my um, my early childhood experiences. For us, our family, we originated here in the United States. Our family had a farm in Wyoming, but in 1932, our family was repatriated. That would be our grandparents, my mother, and the first half of the family. 
their farm was taken away from them, their um, birth certificates and any land deeds, and they were sent packing. They went to Mexico and um, started a business in Guanajuato, Mexico. They were not accepted in the United States and they were not accepted in Mexico. In the United States, they were considered Mexicans and in Mexico, they were considered gringos. Um, it, it, is, it was, a, for our family, I found a very shameful thing for them because our mother and our aunts and uncles did not discuss this. As I went on into my education, I was very inquisitive and began to ask questions of our mother who was not very willing to give these, uh, the information up until interestingly enough, um, much of this came out on her deathbed. That's when she was willing to give up the secrets um, that um, you know our grandmother in her early years uh, was taken from the family and put into foster care. And then from foster care, she essentially was um, a, uh, a cook and a nanny for a family um, on a farm. And uh, the reason I kept asking is why does uh, our grandmother know how to make scones, a great rhubarb pie, and fry chicken up like no Mexicans do. Um, yet she also knew the traditional uh, dishes as well. And um, I kept pushing and pushing until finally it came out um, what it was like for them growing up. So initially they were in Colorado and they moved into Wyoming and then they were repatriated. Could we kind of go, will we go to the next slide, please, Christine? Thank you. So one of the things that's rarely discussed is during the Great Repatriation, um, uh, this was during the Great Depression of 29 to 1939, uh, where an estimated, the accepted amount is said 1.5 million. They really believe it was more than that, but the most acceptable figure that they will accept is 1.5 million. And uh, it was very much uh, like the Japanese internment camps uh, where they lost everything and they were pushed out. Now the Japanese Americans, they lost things, their uh, businesses, homes and whatnot, and they were interned where uh, the Mexicans were repatriated into to Mexico. For myself growing up, I grew up in a very small town called Barstow in California, and um, the Mexican Americans were not allowed to live in city limits. Our parents uh, built a home outside of city limits. We had no streets, no street lights, no, um, for a period there, no running water, and no sewer system. Um, they, we had to walk to school and then the African Americans or blacks lived on the other side of town and they were bused into school. There was a definite separation of us all throughout and even up into, um, you know, towards my graduation and leaving high school. Race and discrimination was not discussed at all, ever. We just knew that uh, we had to keep our place. And then I'll tell this one story and then we'll move on. Uh, Christy can share. Um, I can remember one time uh, getting my things together because I wanted to go to the public pool. And I was going, my cousin and I were gonna walk over to the pool. And our older brother said, where, where are you going? And I said, we're gonna go to the pool. My cousin Herminia and I. And he started laughing. He says, they're not gonna let you in. And I said, why not? I have my 50 cents. And he said, just watch. So we walk over there, we go in and walk up and the guy looks at us up and down, gives us a once over and says, pool's full. We walk over and we look at each other and we look at the chain link fence. And I looked at my cousin, I said, doesn't look full to me. Does it look full to you? She goes, no, maybe he made a mistake. Let's go back. So we went back and he said, I told you, pool's full. Now get up, go on, move on, out of here. 
And we walk home and my brother, uh, I go home and he says, they didn't let you in, did they? And I said, no, but I don't understand why. And he goes, you dummy. He says, they only let us in when they're going to dr drain the pool the day before, after. Then they, then they drain the pool after that. And that was a real eye opener for me um, in that we truly were different. So that's my one of my experiences. And then I'll hand it over to Christy now. Thank you. Um, for me, I think I grew up um, different than that. Um, I grew up in the like early mid 80s um, in, during my childhood. Um, in Oklahoma, as I mentioned earlier, um, where being a Native American was commonplace for everyone. <laughs> um, so to some degree, everyone had um, claims of being um, a tribal affiliated person, um, whether it was a Cherokee, a Seminole, a Creek, a Choctaw, um, all around there. Even today, if you drive through any of the, if just driving down the I-40, you'll see 10 different um tags, license plates, because so many um, nations have their tribal government seats there. So if you're a member of that tribe, you can get a tribal tag and you don't have to have a state of Oklahoma tag. So there's uh, so many different tags. So for me, being um, a Native American identifying person, it was just commonplace. It didn't seem like a, um, you know, um, distinguishing thing to be, but I do recall as a child, um, I went to a private Christian school and there was a, a lady who took our lunch tickets every day. And she would always ask me, cause I don't remember why I wore it in the first place, but I had a, a, an outfit that was very cultural representative. And she would always ask me, when are you going to wear your Indian dress? When are you going to wear your Indian dress? She just liked to see me in, in my pretty little dress. And I never thought anything of it. She just thought it was pretty and wanted to see it when I would when I would wear it again, but I, I didn't just wear it. It usually was for some occasion. And so it was never anything I thought about as far as being um, good, bad, or ugly. It just was when, and that everyone understood um, what I was and that it was normal. It wasn't until like I was an adult, like many of you mentioned that I noticed that there were differences in understandings and um, going to grad school in on the East Coast um, and being exposed to then, because Oklahoma is so, even though it's a mixture of predominantly, at least when I was growing up, predominantly either native, white, or um, both, because that would be me, because um, I'm both, uh, that it was pretty, that those were your options. So it seemed pretty homogenous and the values seemed pretty, the, pretty similar. But when I went to um, just outside of Boston to go to um, grad school and ha having exposure to international students who didn't um, have knowledge of what a Native American was or what that looked like today, I was, my eyes were opened um, to what stereotypes existed still about thinking we still rode around on horses and lived in teepees and things like that. And that was in the year 2000. Um, so that was just a very eye-opening experience to have exposure to other people, um, myself, um, to, to not just take for granted that they knew um, what it meant and what it looked like to be an indigenous person in modern times. And so that's something that's impacted me now is having that um, and really realizing that representation matters and that, you know, when it's, if it's only, um, your, that it doesn't exist, then, then, then how will people know what, what you're really like, or that one person doesn't represent all of them. Um, so that was something that really was, um, impactful to, to my, um, journey moving forward which that kind of takes us into the next slide, which is um, about memories that you have of your family that taught you about the various kinds of diversity or differences among people and your own cultural identity.
I think um, if you just want to kind of sit on this topic, I'm, I'll move forward to talk about a more historical context for specifically early childhood education. And if anyone wants to, you know, uh, chime in with a, a thought about this question, then feel free. Um, but I just wanted to, like, um, since Yolanda had already kind of given an overarching background, I wanted to speak specifically to the historical context of the creation of early childhood education as we know it. And as um, I think, uh, Mr. Fuller, you mentioned, you know, you had someone in the home who was Black who was, bore the burden of domestic work, including childcare. And that's the history, really, where we start of looking at early childhood education, because that's where it began. It's, um, you know, when it didn't reside in per se the mother um, as the, the um, primary caregiver, it was historically black women as slaves and then um, maybe as underpaid labor um, to continue on as um, the child care within a home setting. Um, but again, as Yolanda mentioned, there is a bifurcation in um, early childhood, which it's between the upper and middle class children and then programs for poor children. And the actual first formal early childhood programs. Yes. Someone needs to mute Linda on interference on someone's line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me okay. let me mention something too, Chris. Christy. I can't sure. see, so I can't read anything on the screen. So I can't respond to questions that are up on the screen. I just can't see them at all. So Oh, just, right now just, there's there's no questions on the screen right now. Right. It's just yeah. kind of what I'm talking about. That, right. That's yeah. There. Yeah. I just wanted you to know that I can't I can't respond to things that are pr printed on the screen because I can't see them. So <laughs> no problem. Um, so our the first actual formal early childhood education programs for birth to school age children were modeled after German kindergartens, and they were founded around the, the mid 1800s. And those were for children around um, the toddler age, which would be about two to six or seven, again, before they would go into formal school settings. And they did have kind of an educational component, but typically they were designed for keeping kids safe while mothers were away, like Yolanda mentioned um, earlier when mothers had to go into the workforce. And so some of these kindergartens were funded by parental fees. So those who had money could pay for enriching and educating, which would be the middle and upper class children. And then there were free kindergartens designed for immigrant and poor children. Um, and then day nurseries, um, which were run by charitable organizations typically. So those nurseries were designed to give um, poor mothers a safe place to leave their children um, while they worked. And they focused on teaching uh, moral habits um, for those poor immigrant children um, because they were viewed as incapable of properly socializing their children. And um, they often had... Um, yeah, no, like really, again, it wasn't designed specifically for um, educating them in, a, in a, any kind of academic sense that we would think of more today. It was really just for uh, custodial care. But then there was a shift that um, really home was the only place for um children and that the mother was the best caretaker. So that support kind of started to wane and about and, and then in 1909, the White House Conference on Children had speakers that stated things such as home life is the highest and finest product of civilization and that children should be kept with their parents. So they started providing aid um, as necessary to families suffering from temporary misfortune. But um, again, looking from my perspective and lens, there was a contrary um, phenomenon occurring at this time, which would be uh, the Native American boarding school era. So uh, if you can see this, there's a photo on this slide that I have, and that's actually my mother, because my mother did attend boarding schools. And so in the... Uh, 1819 uh, uh, Indian Civilization Act and the peace policy of 1869, the United States government and Christian churches 
adopted Indian boarding school policies with the express intent, it was a stated intent to kill the Indian and save the man. And so between 1869 and the 60s, but actually continued into much more, uh, even further times, hundreds of thousands of Native American children were removed from their homes and, and placed in boarding schools that were operated by the federal government and churches. And those children were removed to be taken far away where they were punished for speaking their native languages, banned from acting in any way that might be seen to represent their traditional cultural practices. They were stripped of their clothing, their hair, their personal belongings and punished um, severely for behaviors that reflected their native culture. So the attitude that mothers were the best caretakers did not apply to all. And this was a concerted effort to completely um, eradicate, basically create a genocide again for native communities. And it was explicitly centered on whiteness to the, the, the degradation of language, culture, fam familial and community ties so that they, through removal of safety and protection, um, of the only homes that these children knew during their most impressionable and formative times of their lives. And again, the aim was to destroy their identity as a Seminole, as a Diné, as a Seneca, um, and to assimilate them to the dominant culture under the guise of charity or salvation. Oh, you're on mute, Yolanda. Sorry, if I may, that is a perfect example of education too. To make conformity, to listen, to follow, not to question. Thank you, Christy. Mm -hmm. So to kind uh, of- it, it, it was a tragedy because um, it is now known that children <clears throat> who are separated from their mother, especially early in life, uh, are more prone to become drug addicts and alcoholics. Uh, the, you, taking away an identity, this is a terrible thing to do. <clears throat> and And that was the aim. <laughs> to basically, you know, create further genocide within the native population to, you know, because that's the building block, right, of any culture is the family system, and they disrupted and destroyed it. In addition to that, it's the destruction of cultural identity. And cultural identity is is very integral to us all to know who we are, and where we come from. And that what we are and where we come from is valued mm -hmm. and good. Well, there's a negative side to that as well. Um, I was told that it was wonderful that I had ancestors, an ancestor who came on the Mayflower. He actually fell off and got back on. And uh, this was supposedly wonderful. And then I was at a business dinner in Houston and there was a very beautiful dark skinned woman at the table. And I made the mistake of mentioning this. She said, my ancestors met the Mayflower. That's the last time I ever mentioned it in public. And uh, then I read the book, The Mayflower and found out that my ancestors were horrible people and did terrible things. And, you know, <laughs> It, I mean, my, my family was so proud to have those ancestors. And my father was governor general of the state of Connecticut. And my mother was DAR. And all this stuff, which now appears to me to be totally worthless and misleading to the ancestors who follow these people, I mean, to the, to the progenitors later generations. And I was taught that of all this, I was some kind of superior human being. This was not useful information. It was inhibiting. It was harmful. And they were very prejudiced against anyone. I mean, the Polish people, and the Jewish people, and the Italians, and the Irish, and the people who came into this country. 
uh, I'm at my, my mother's mother, especially, would sit in the kitchen with my mother and spout this hate stuff about all the people who came into the country. And this was bad. It took me a long time to get over. Well, if I may, for the culture of origin, we, uh, it was being valued by our standards today versus our standards of yesterday. And the word civilization was important in this, I believe. We had civilized Europeans and North American, South American savages and African savages. And it was the duty of the good Christian to bring these savages to civilization. And that was not ironic or anything else. That was the more norm. And the thing that strikes me is that norm was predominant up through the time when I was an adult. I was in New Orleans in 1959 and 60, when the segregated trolley cars were desegregated. And the norm was the West was the civil, we, we, I don't know how many people went to college and took a course called Western Civilization or Western Civ, that this was the norm. And the values that we heard here were minority values, Quakers among others, uh, I think had those values for many, many years, but they were definitely a minor substream of the great obvious, of course, the West is civilized and advanced and these primitive backwards people have to be brought to it to the degree that they can, can, can take it, of course, because they weren't really able to do the full benefits. And I'm not, I'm saying that with a certain amount of tongue in cheek, but in the day when I was a young adult and a child growing up, that was the norm, was civilization was for the Europeans, from the Europeans to the world, and other people were inferior, period. Thank you, Will, for sharing that. This is Yolanda. Um, that is the Eurocratic practices. And um, it, it didn't end there. We, our systems are still steeped in that. It's just not so overt now. It's our systems are still in place, uh, very much so. Um, it, uh, I heard an analogy one time that I thought was a very good analogy when you look at the Euro practices or Eurocentric view of the world. Um, it would be like us starting a monopoly game and Christy and I starting saying the rule is, is we get to start the game, we'll play for 45 minutes and then we'll let you start playing. At that point, we will have owned everything and you will owe us what you have, right? So that's in essence the Euro practices that, that uh, in essence were in place and that set up our systems, if you will. Let me just mention that there were a couple of papal bulls that were issued back in the 1500s. And I don't remember the specifics, but I read about it within the last six months or so. And these papal bulls explained and justified the Europeans in their, in their advance around the world in colonization and explained why it was appropriate because it was God's work that they were taking civilizations to the, to the savage countries. And that was what they, that was the logic of, of the European nations being able to go out and colonize and take over native lands where other people obviously lived. <laughs> and, but this, this explained and justified that practice. And so it's an interesting thing that that was actually written down as, as the policy and the explanation of why it was all right to do that. Yes, that reminds me of the book, if you've not read it, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And uh, uh, that kind of explains uh, the, the domination, if you will, of cultures and civilizations from the beginning of time. And uh, again, to reiterate and expand upon what you did say, in a sense, that is where we got the manifest destiny, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. One of those bulls was, in fact, called the, the Doctrine of Discovery, was one book codifying it. 
And, and we're talking here about competing systems of value and very distinctly different systems of value. The papal bull, you were talking there of the head of the church, not, not churches, but the church of Western civilization with Catholics. I think it's somewhat ironic that in this country, the people who were being discriminated against because they were inferior, the Italians, the Irish, the Poles, were Catholics. Exactly. And they, so values change. Yes. And I, I agree that the other values have by no means gone away. And to some extent, what we call conservatism is a revival of the values of, of hierarchy and people who deserve and people who don't deserve inherently, which uh, gets to be a little interesting. Mm -hmm. Oops. Well, I think um, this all kind of uh, filters into the, the fact that, as, as Yolanda mentioned, systems. Systems are still being impacted by these, um, these tenets and these, um, and, and you, I don't know if you are aware, but um, preschool children are expelled at rates more than three times higher than children in K through 12 settings. And uh, to dig deeper, as of 2016, um, I have some statistics that show black public preschool children are suspended from school at higher rates um, than their counterparts of other groups. Um, where black preschool children are 3.6 times as likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions as the white pre preschool children. And then when you break it down even more by gender, black boys represent 19% of uh, the male preschool and or of, yeah, male preschool enrollment, but 45% of male preschool children receiving one or more out of school suspensions. And black girls represent 20% of female school enrollment, but 54% of them, uh, of female preschool children receiving uh, those suspensions. And then in, when we do look at K-12, there's a similar um, trend where black students are expelled at, again, highly uh, disproportionate rates. Black students are 1.9 times more likely to be expelled from school. Um, black boys represent 8% of all students, but 19% of the expulsions. Black girls are 8% of all students, but 9% of students expelled um, without any educational services. Uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives, whites and multicultural boys also are, so boys are dis disproportionately expelled from school. Um, where, where white boys represent 26% of all students, 35% of those students are expelled without um, educational services. American Indian and Alaska Native boys are 0.6% of all students, which that's also a problem, right? Um, but 2% um, of students expelled without services. And then multiracial boys are 2% of all students, but are 4% of students expelled without educational services. Um, however, an interesting point is that Latino and Asian boys and girls, um, as well as Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, uh, as well as white girls, are not disproportionately expelled um, when we're looking at the K-12 world. Uh, but black students are more likely to be disciplined than through law enforcement as well. So that's where we're talking about a school uh, and particularly the preschool. So it even has a name, PTPP, the preschool to prison pipeline, um, where black students are 2.2 times as likely to receive a referral to law enforcement or be subject to school related arrests as white students. And if I, I may expound on that, when we're looking at the K-12 system, because I worked there for 30 years, um, schools, generally have a um, police officer that has been loaned to schools, not a school district, but they are there, they have an office, and um, they're considered a resource officer. So um, they get names of students, and um, this also helps with that prison school to prison pipeline because the students early on, if they're being suspended or whatnot, already they're being flagged 
And now uh, disproportionately, if maybe they're driving, they're in high school, they're gonna be pulled over, their seats of their cars are gonna be pulled out, they're gonna be searched, um, unlawful searches, and because generally speaking, they're lower socioeconomic students, um, the families do not understand and know their rights and will not enforce them. So they're essentially, if you will, targeted and bullied early on. So what's the cause? Obviously, we, we I think we know, ding, ding, ding. Um, racially disproportionate discipline in early childhood education um, indicates structural racism. There's no evidence that black children display a greater or more severe misbehavior, despite more likely being suspended um, or expelled. And disproportionate preschool suspensions are the result of adult behaviors. They arise from our implicit racial biases, which impact teacher expectations. So if we're using a racial equity lens, this treatment is um, manifesting is a manifestation of racism at an institutional level. And so our uh, discipline rates can be conceptualized as an indicator of that institutionalized racism. And it's, as, as Yolanda was stating, that it's basically, we're starting at the most formative years of life with preschool suspensions that contribute to a loss of time um, and then furthering that achievement gap and then they have this negative school trajectory beginning in at ages three and four. Maybe at, typically it's a, that's when you might see it happening um, and at the preschool range. And then young students who are expelled or suspended are 10 times more likely to drop out of high school. So they're experiencing academic, academic failure, um, poor grades. Um, they get negative school attitudes and then they face incarceration at much higher rates. Mm -hmm. And the American Psychological Association found that schools that opt for exclusionary discipline have less satisfactory ratings of school climate and less satisf satisfactory school governance structures with little reduction in the actual classroom disruptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. So studies of school suspension show that 30 to 50% of those who are suspended um, will be suspended again or expelled again. And for some students, then sus suspension is actually a reinforcer than a punisher of these unwanted behaviors. So it's really not even an effective deterrent to the behaviors as, as to why they got, got expelled or suspended. So it really doesn't work and it has all these negative consequences. And then to take it even further. Oh, and the sad part. Well, go ahead. The, the sad part is that the attitudes come from the adults because children at three and four don't see the differences in race unless they've been taught. And if the children were allowed to relate without the influence of a prejudiced adult, these would be so different. At least that's what I've read, that the little kids don't care what color your skin is. You're just another kid. So this that really magnifies the fact that preschool is a two-tiered system based on socioeconomic status. And those who have generally enrolled their children in schools for enrichment and that are play-based and child-centered, those who do not have are dependent upon uh, family, friends, neighbors, and early Head Start, where this is where the data comes from, is the Head Start preschool programs. But to take it a step further back, it has to do with our national pre-service uh, of teachers entering the field of education who have little or no awareness of the issues of racism, xenophobia, hetero, normativity, ableism, or gender bias. And that's King, 2005, Sleater, 2001, Swartz, 2005. So the pedagogies where we are still um, bringing the teachers up with continue to dominate the pedagogy policy and practice of our educational institutions that have um, 
these pedagogies are still Eurocentric, if you will. And um, the, the, the teacher education programs, the in-service of professional development for them is still centered on the ongoing effects of colonialism and the curriculum that promotes that, if you will. And it's been well documented that children of color are consistently over-referred, not just for uh, suspensions, but for special education programs and under-referred for gifted programs. And the inequity of uh, being disciplined, which is what Christy really went over. So as a result, the experience, the confidence, or the support necessary to sustain equity ideologies once they enter the teaching profession and their classroom. So um, what Pacific Oaks college specifically does is we look at and we push teachers to investigate how eurocratic practices not only disempowers communities and disenfranchises children who are marginalized but it how it communicates the centrality of whiteness to every student and um it, it's it's we're going to get into it later for implicit and explicit bias but now let's look at our next question have you considered how this may be different from what other people may have learned in their culture how have or do these differences in culture affect your relationships and interactions with others I, I think I have a thought in mind about this in relation to like Yolanda and I uh, have expressed, you know, she's Mexican, I'm Native American, but we have a lot of similarities in our cultures that kind of, I think, have supported our work together because we have a perspective that's very similar of how the world works. And so that contributes to a very um, productive working relationship, as well as I would venture to say a very um, loving friendship, you know, beyond our professional experience. And so the, the relationships and interactions we have have been very rich and very deep because we have a very similar shared cultural value system. And I think that that's um, a strength that we have. I don't, I think that on the flip side for me, there's a lot of distrust um, for some others <laughs> because of these experiences that, um, you know, I've heard discussed uh, in my household. You know, my mother um, had expressed to me that she was very thankful that my sister and I, unlike our brother, um, could pass in whichever um, world we needed to, whether we were engaged in like tribal cultural experiences or whether we were out in the quote unquote white world, we could fit in um, because, because not only of our, our culture, but because of our coloring. Um, uh, my mom's oldest, her son, he was a little on the darker side. So he maybe didn't have that, if you want to call it benefit that we had. So I, I definitely think that those things um, have impacted my relationships and interactions with others. I'm usually not very want, e easily to share and get close to people because um, the, the, the trust, is, trust isn't just um, automatically present. Thank you for sharing that. Christy, I'd like to share mine. It's really interesting. Uh, we're we have similarities and we have vast great differences as well um i don't know if you can see me on screen i am a lighter latina and as a result i was never really accepted as a latina i always had to prove my my latina and when also to forming my identity our father sat us down one time and he said the government calls you mexican-american 
He said, you're an American. You have parents that are Americans that you were born here. You're an American. That's a label that was given to you. But even so, we always had to mark that box, right? Mexican American, even though we were not from Mexico, nor were we born in Mexico, not one, not two generations, but nevertheless, that was the label that was given to us. And um, so not being fully accepted and still questioned to this day um, by my counterparts, um, how I keep the customs and traditions. Do you cook traditional foods? And then, yes, I do. I have felt that that has been very important. I have made it um, my lifelong quest, if you will, to keep those customs and those traditions, and I have passed them down. And for holidays, I have the family over. I, I am the, the keeper of those memories and those traditions, if you will. So I was not fully accept and still not fully accepted in the Latino world, if you will. And um, then also too, not fully accepted here either. And it's much like a quote that I heard in the movie uh, um, depicting the life of Selena, the singer. And she said, I'm not accepted here and I'm not accepted there. Then who am I? What am I? And that was always a cultural identity question that I had to ask myself. And it was a quest that I went on and uh, fully um, as a traveler into South America to learn more about the Latin um, cultures and to really center myself in who I am, no matter where I go, um, just to have those strong roots. Um, so that, that's been my experience. I think it's very interesting uh, thinking about where you grow up and growing up with my living very close with my Irish grandparents. I always sort of loosely thought of myself as Irish American, but in Shreveport, there was no Irish community. And in the Northeast, uh, the Irish neighborhoods initially were Irish slums and those slums then became Irish neighborhoods. But I, but I didn't grow up in that kind of environment. There was no such thing in Shreveport. So there was no sort of stigma and there were never any questionnaires that had an Irish American checkbox for me to check. <laughs> so I never became aware of anything like that until later on in my education when I began to learn more about the world and realize how different the world was in different places. So a little bit different perspective on that identification. Well, you know, my kids were my kids were largely responsible for expanding my horizons in that um, my older son has had both a Filipino and a Mexican wife. Uh, my younger son has had partners from Indonesia, China, uh, very various. I, I counted it up once and we have had intimate associations in our family with 12 different ethnicities. And so my, my view now, the world view, whereas it, the New England view, and it's nothing but educational. I have learned so much from all the people I have known from other cultures. And I think that's where people fall down. They don't understand that each contact with someone from another culture is an opportunity to grow and to learn. I mean, the food alone is an adventure. Well, if I may, uh, I think it's interesting that when you say culture, you kind of have to mean, what do you mean by culture? And that's a larger topic, but I can just sort of make the differentiation between two kinds of culture. One being a culture based on color or, or looks in general, the darker people. You say the darker people in the family were accepted as Latino and the lighter were not and vice versa in the dominant Europe, uh, by Northern European culture, the lighter were more accepted. And so you're torn between those, whereas Irish look white. You know, John Kennedy, for example, uh, or the Germans look white, Dwight Eisenhower, for example, and so on. But people who look darker, and this is not just in the United States, of course, this is all over the world. There's a, a large market in lightening creams where you get your darker features uh, lightened up a bit 
and Asians get their eyes changed to be more European and so on, then the, the dominance of Europe is incredibly powerful. And back to the idea of the statistics on racial discrimination. Those statistics, A, are very consistent across South, North, East, West in this country. That's, uh, those numbers are about three and a half, four percent all over the place. They are also discouragingly consistent over time. Mm -hmm. Now, Portland is a, considers itself a very progressive liberal city and has been strong emphasis on getting rid of those dis disparate discipline issues and all sorts of programs throughout all of that. The statistics have remained constant. So we're talking about some pretty powerful forces, but I would suggest the forces based on color are huge. One exception, income, uh, class, because as you know, because of a variety of factors, people of color tend to be poorer than white people or European. And when you control for class, the differences diminish rad radically, but they don't disappear. So there is a class <laughs> distinction that's itself a race-based thing that, that makes it a really sticky wicket we're dealing with, especially when you look at today with the backlash against critical race theory, quote unquote, or sexual indoctrination. And I don't know about Pasadena, but Oregon right now, a lot of people are saying the conservatives, Republicans, we don't want this indoctrination of people by these radical liberal values. And so it's very much a present issue and a, a, a complex one. The, maintaining the value that we're talking about here and believing in respect for people across cultures, respect for the differences without making them invidious is a value system that's somewhat in peril right now, I think. Thank you, Will, for bringing that up. Uh, one of the things, if I may, um, um, expand upon is that when we're discussing, it's kind of like that analogy that I discussed earlier. If we were to play the game Monopoly and Christy and I started uh, 45 minutes before you did, Will, and then we allowed you in, it w the systems would be in place. So that's really what we're discussing when, when you talk about uh, socioeconomic status. The rules have been made up uh, the game has been played, uh, systems are in place. And um, uh, one of the things that I would like us to consider when we're looking at what is being discussed right now politically in the political hotbed of what's happening in our nation, but not just our nation, but globally, is uh, language. So language is being used as a tool in uh, forming people's thoughts and opinions. That language and those sound bites, if you will, didn't just happen. They've been in the workings for about 40 years uh, because they, um, there are, the systems have been challenged. And this goes back to the 60s uh, when um, all of the people took, many, many people, not all, but many people took to the streets to uh, protest the war in Vietnam. That had not happened before. And there was the question that was brought up. Now, education it was to make them conform. They're questioning the common good of education is not working in the way we wa wanted it or designed it to be. They are questioning. And that's when public education began, the, the, there was a concerted effort to begin to dismantle education as being the tool what has made America great has been that we have always educated the masses. If we look at the desegregation of education, it took place in law and policy, but it really didn't really happen. 
What ended up happening is that we had the great white flight from K-12 public system into privates and charter schools. We have more segregation now than ever before. And um, what is happening, not just in our nation, but globally is the nationalization. So people are moving more into tribes, if you will. And uh, that's what we're seeing. And those who have the means to put sound bites out and to uh, corner the language, those are the voices that are being heard. When we hear freedom of speech, it isn't that we don't have freedom of speech, it's amplification of what they want to say over other voices. And so at the heart of our nation, um, at this point, our, what we're really grappling with is um, e pulveris unum, out of many one, is it really or is it not? We're grappling, so it will be interesting to see what happens. And I think that brings us to this one and what we were gonna end with was advocacy. And if I may, one out of every 10 individuals actively engage in community service. While I was raising my children, I, I volunteered in my community and I saw the same faces all throughout their preschool, elementary, high school years, and then even through how, uh, working with and uh, with my grandchildren, I saw the same faces over and over. That's been my experience. What we're seeing less and less of is the time of service of individuals, young, youthful individuals of giving of their time and service to their communities. And um, that's where we see change. That's where we see the uplifting and the elevating of ideals of how we would like to see things move into. And I believe that um, in these discussions, it's the understanding of the importance of what you do in this group and then of looking at coaching youths to instill a sense of duty to their communities, to their state, to their country in advocacy and in service. I mean, let me make sure I heard you correctly. Are you saying there is currently a decline in the percentage of people, young people going into community service activities? Yeah, they're not volunteering like they used to. There's been a decline. There's a book called Bowling Alone. <laughs> and uh, so um, community for youth isn't the same as it was for you or even for me or for Christy. It's changing. We're not seeing the volunteerism like we used to. However, what could happen is we are seeing um, a movement um, that did start when I'm, I'm forgetting her name, the one with the, the global, uh, the green movement. Um, so there are some, but when you look at communities, if you look at our communities, and I look at, I'll, I'll discuss where I live, the youth are not um, volunteering. Even, the, even to find active PTAs in a K-12 system is not the same as it used to. You're talking about Greta Thunberg, right? Yes. Greta Thunberg? Yes, yeah. thank you. She's amazing. Yes, she well, is. There's Alexandra Octavio Cortez, myself, but there's another one, yeah. yeah. But there's so many that are against uh, Ocasio. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they defame her right and left. <laughs> Don't you think that a lot of this is that people are connecting on a screen rather than in person? I do think that the electronic age has changed the entire way that people communicate. 
And people spend more time addicted to their phone than they do out seeing what might need to be done in their community. That's it right there. It's the addiction to technology has created uh, more of a me mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, and that me mentality is, if you look at what we've seen since COVID is, um, uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I won't speak for everyone, but as I'm driving, uh, a red light no longer means stop or yellow even to slow down because that's just a suggestion that applies to you and not to me. I see many people running those red lights. Our okay. norms are being challenged right now because the selfishness in our nation has grown. The me mentality. Me first. As we so, say this over uh, this technology is kind of as funny. they use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, I have heard it. This is kind of funny. I think it's interesting that one of the distinguishing characteristics that Alexis de Tocqueville noticed about Americans is, is the citizen involvement and initiation of activities to solve social problems. And uh, what you're saying, and, and I've heard that statistic other places, is that we're seeing a, a turn away from that in the current world and, and less citizen involvement. And so in, in direct action, whereas the Europeans tended to turn more to, govern, to government for solutions, Americans would do things as volunteer groups. And uh, okay. de Tocqueville identified that as one of the distinguishing characteristics of the American culture. Correct, yeah. And uh, so what's happening is, uh, what we're seeing is those who have the means are creating groups that amplify the voice, and that's what we're hearing. It's not necessarily that that's the greatest voice or, or the majority of the voice. It's not that it's a majority voice, it is the greater voice that's being amplified out there, if you will. And so um, I think people, well, one is that me mentality, but it's also a disenfranchisement and uh, people feeling discouraged and not really engaging in the process like they used to. Wow. And a lot of what they're finding about the social media emphasizes a lot of this uh, tendency too, because it emphasizes negative news because that attracts yeah. more uh, more attention. And so there are a lot of social for there are a lot of forces at work here that uh, really shape uh, the technology related that shape uh, where things are going these days. And some of that may be something that we can address and solve. And some of it, it's like just who knows what to do. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, it was hard to know where the me, me, me came from, but I've heard Mr. Rogers blamed because he told all the kids they were fine just the way they were. <laughs> there is that. Although I'm thinking all of this talk, we talked about the persistence of racism and so on. And I'm thinking that, as I said, the shift we talked about was fairly recent in my lifetime, most of our lifetimes. But I'm thinking about when I lived in Pasadena, in the 1950s and early, whether a group of educated middle-class Pasadenans would be saying this, because I think the conversation would be very different. They'd be worried about the uh, black people causing crime and maintaining the quality of our neighborhoods. And I remember distinctly driving a Pasadena real estate agent to her summer home in Balboa Island passing a part of town, she said, that's Coon Town over there. And so I think we've got to give credit to the fact that this sort of a conversation is taking place today with the values we've been talking about today that would not have been the norm about less than 50 years ago. Well, thank you very much, Yolanda and Christy. This has been a wonderful presentation. I'm delighted that we have this available on tape. And uh, I think that uh, as we spread the news about what a great presentation this was, I think we'll get some views of other people who, for one reason or another, couldn't make it to the presentation today. So uh, thank you. Linda thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Hold on, I Linda, Linda Pope. Has <laughs> I finally got home. I'm sorry, I was in my car. I listened to my car. Um, I have a question. 
Sure. Don't think, um, everything you said is just on point, obviously, and, and well documented. But going forward, we, we are facing what's going on in Texas with changing textbooks to eliminate history. Other than electing school board members, I think it's going to be on families to continue to tell their stories. Correct. It's a grassroots effort. It, it, it has to be there. We can't send our kids to school expecting them to be taught what's our responsibility. Right. But if I may, when I grew up, uh, the way I grew up, um, it wasn't discussed in, in school at all. It's something that I realized later on as an adult. And uh, that helped center me even more in searching out more about our, our culture, our ethnicity. Uh, and culture meaning our customs, our traditions, our beliefs, and then not just that, because uh, it's it's within that. It's it's the other things within that. It's it's your your uh, you know your your uh, the the recipes that have been handed down uh, throughout generations. It's perhaps clothing that was passed down, as Christy discussed earlier. That's our culture. Whether you're Irish American, Native American, African American, or Mexican American. And that, I think, brings us back to that e pulbris unum. We are. Out of many, we should be one. But we're at a time where that's being used to divide us even further. But you know, I think in an ideal culture, it would be okay to be tribal with your people of your ethnicity and your background and your family, but, but, but to understand I lost you. And I apologize, but Christy and I have like two more minutes or yeah, maybe one minute more and we have another meeting that we have to attend. But we want to thank you all for, for allowing us to come and present. And we thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. It was very really good. Thank you. You're beautifully thank you. done. Thank and you so my, much. My, my, bless little, you, my brother thank and sister you. went to Pacific Oaks when they were little kids. So I'm glad to see it's still around and thriving. Awesome. It is. <laughs> My training programs at the University of Nebraska and in Washington, D.C. had a huge part of curriculum coming from Pacific Oaks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy the thank rest you. of your day. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. We hope to see you in future presentations. All right. Bye. Thank you, Dick. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. What's the matter here? There you go, got it.